Okay, so hello and welcome back to part B of mobile commerce and ubiquitous computing for our um, e-business subject. I'm joined with Professor Katina Michael. So welcome Katina to our class. Um, for students, this uh, part of the lecture will be also um, placed online and publicly available for others who might benefit from discussions around mobile commerce and ubiquitous computing. Um, we won't cover any aspects or no aspects relating to the subject or assessments will be placed online though. Thank you for joining us, Katina. How are you today? I'm really well. Thanks for the opportunity. Inadvertently, actually, the COVID crisis has made me land back in Sydney, Australia, and I'm with you not far from Wollongong University. We're very happy to have you, Katina. Students have been waiting for you to join us in this subject, so I've promised them this from the beginning of the session. We've sort of led up to our discussions of mobile commerce by framing the entire subject around e-business in a very broad kind of sense of the term, so encompassing things importantly around operations and the operations landscape and perspective. And then we've started to discuss at this particular point in time, and sort of this late in the session, we're in week 10 at the moment, and um, start to think about innovative e-commerce models. So last week we spoke about models associated with e-government, for example. We also spoke about um, e-learning and um, e-training online, which is quite important and, and quite timely, I think, um, uh, for what we're going through at the moment and our transition to online learning. The students have um, been brilliant in this subject and engaging with the material. Um, so I think this is going to be great. And if we can support this um, with some kind of live Q&A, I think some students will be very um, happy to have a chat about what they've learned in this subject and how they can take particularly things around mobile commerce and what's happening in the world around us um, further in terms of discussion areas. So I might just share Katina um, our, my screen and continue with the second part of the lecture. Okay, to set that up. So um, just for students and for anyone who's viewing this particular um, lecture, the idea is that we've um, set the foundations for all the foundations around mobile commerce in terms of a basic overview of what it means. And um, this is for a second year e-business subject that attracts students from a range of different disciplines and a range of different um, academic backgrounds. So we've got people from the, um, the information sciences and from engineering. We've also got marketers, we've got psychologists, we've got um, managers or potential future managers and so on. So it's, it's pitched at a broad um, kind of student cohort and we're building on the foundational concepts around mobile commerce and ubiquitous computing um, through our discussion with Professor Katina Michael. Katina, I might get you to introduce yourself um, to the students and to our viewers, if you don't mind, and tell us um, what you're doing at the moment, what you're interested in, your research areas and so on. Uh, first of all, Roba, thank you. Uh, I miss Wollongong University, although I'm back every June to August or thereabouts, uh, teaching for the School of Computing and Information Technology, which I was a member of and still am a member of you know, on a very fractional basis. Uh, but my full-time job uh, is at Arizona State University, uh, where I uh, began about two years ago now. And I'm in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and a joint hire in the School of Computing, Informatics and Decision Systems Engineering. And I direct a very innovative um, group of people. We're a collective, not a center. Um, and the group that I lead is called SPEC, uh, Society Policy and Engineering Collective. And it's a group of like-minded people who are interested in uh, looking at society first and policy second and engineering last, I may say. It's more about looking at the needs of society and responding with technological solutions, but ensuring that people are very much informed, consulting people uh, who um, technology uh, will affect, but also letting uh, uh, technology be use-inspired. It's not only user-centered, but use-inspired. What do you need today and how can technology help? Now, when those things don't happen in that order and we have solutions that just pop out of anywhere, we are backpedaling and then we start to talk about social justice issues, environmental justice issues, equity issues, uh, accessibility issues and the like. And so I'm very fortunate to have uh, all of the, the members of my team uh, across and joint hires um, in the school that I work in. Uh, there are 50 uh, faculty and we have about 38 disciplines represented in that 50 faculty. So it's really about looking at the world's problems and challenges from different lenses, but also 
ensuring that society comes first and everything else comes second, if I can say that. So uh, prior to that, I was at the University of Wollongong. I was the Associate Dean uh, International and began there in 2002 after seven years in the industry before that. Uh, Katina, I think just um, in terms of the, interestingly, you brought up your industry experience and I spoke a bit about it in the first part of the lecture, but can you share a bit of details about um, your industry experience, particularly in the telecommunications sector and as it relates to e-business more specifically? Yeah, um, my first opportunity was in a cooperative semester working for what was then Anderson Consulting and is known as Accenture today. And I was doing a project on identity at the time and the different form factors that identity could be tokenized into. And one of the things that I had was access to Accenture's library, Anderson Consultants' library. And I would go there on the weekend and actually read a lot um, about automatic telemachines, about the beginning of the internet, um, about ways forward. And one of the amazing documents I came across was called the human metaphor. And it was a business person with a tie, hunching over a desk, and the head was actually a cathode road tube. It was actually an LCD screen, right? But back then, it, there were CRT, massive, big monitors. And I stayed there and thought, my God, this is the future, right? This head of a television screen on someone's body, okay? Thereafter, um, I also got to spend a lot of time in manufacturing at Otis Elevator Company in Minto. And I started to learn about asset tracking. I started to learn what happens in an emergency situation when someone's stuck in an elevator. Um, how do we locate elevators? How do we, in this closed space, have two-way communication and feedback loops so people don't you know, suffer from claustrophobia and start to panic and do things like jump out of the elevator, which you can actually do. There are ways to get out because there are ways to get in as well. But also there, I was looking at a competency training. So I created um, Asia's competency training database along with the National Training Manager in Australia uh, and we looked at levels of competency and education required for skills for people that were working on the factory floor, for people who were the drafts people, right? This is before CAD, just as CAD was beginning to take over in the early 90s. Uh, and I sort of understood what information sort of asset management was at a very large scale and also testing. You can't, you know, bring elevators to market or escalators that don't work or fall over and how many times have we gone to supermarkets or shopping centers where it's just dead and i always look at the print and i'm happy to see that it's not otis elevator company it's some other company which i won't mention but this is the whole thing how can our systems be reliable but i was exposed to that world and then of course um my i guess i would say my first long-term love was at nortel networks a global vendor of telecommunications equipment and I learned a lot about the deployment of 2G. I was involved in 3G spectrum auctions across the world. I was actually a modeler that was helping the customer. And the customer at the time were players like Telstra and Optus, of course, Vodafone, uh, Hutchison in Australia. And beyond the borders, uh, I did a lot of work for Hong Kong CSL, uh, SK Telecom, uh, BuyIntel in the Philippines, um, Tata uh, and Reliance in India and was really catapulted. Uh, I was even involved in uh, Kuz Group Telecom, KGT, in Taiwan. So I got to look at how um, things are deployed, what kinds of equipment, what kinds of market needs, how services are conceived of, and then markets invited to take them up. And I would have to say, back then, we really didn't know too much about what services people would definitely require, we were looking at revenues and that's all we were really consult concerned about really. It wasn't doing a needs analysis of what would the future needs be. Um, we were guessing. And in fact, our guesses, uh, we underestimated the need for all of these mobile solutions ourselves. But one thing that we did do was dimension a great deal of capacity in broadband networks, some of these submarine cables between two nations. And you're thinking, hang on, you know, what kinds of systems are, are needed to create these submarine cables? Um, what's the depth of these cables? Um, how do we have redundancy? How does the internet work? And so it was an amazing experience where I got to see a lot of this. And one of the areas of interest was location-based services. Thank you, Katina. So in, in the initial part of 
our lecture, we focused on a definition of what location-based services and location-based commerce as a subset of mobile commerce looks at. And I think we can pick up on that discussion in a second, but we're very thankful to have you with us today. I think it's a privilege to have someone from such a diverse background industry-wise and also with that academic strength as well to be able to inform us of things to do with mobile commerce. And, and that's why I sort of got you to mention. So um, just as a sort of to, to diverge from the discussion for a bit. Um, I've mentioned to students that you are one of my mentors and um, long time mentors and collaborator now, which I'm very fortunate to sort of mention. So I know all of this background detail, but I think it's really important for students to be able to draw from industry experience rather than just from the academic side of things. And that's what we've endeavoured to do as part of this subject, to look at the basic theory and try to get a really strong theoretical understanding of concepts around e-business, but then to fortify that and supplement that with that industry experience. So thank you for joining us. Um, in terms of the format moving forward, I'd like it to be sort, sort of like a semi-formal discussion, almost in a podcast style format. The idea is that I'll present with areas of knowledge or areas of application around mobile commerce and things that um, we think in terms of um, our subject has been important and areas worthy of sort of developing in terms of discussion and I'd like you to just think about in your mind how you see um, certain applications within that particular space playing out why you think they're important in terms of mobile commerce and anything else you'd like to share with us um, would be fantastic as well um, so in terms of the first Point. I think um, with what's happening in Australia, certainly, and also globally, we're starting to see that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has sort of shed light on some mobile commerce applications that we've been sort of addressing you and I and our team for um, almost 15 years of them, um, to date. We're starting to see that there's an increased attention to these mobile commerce applications. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to discuss a bit more about that. So I've popped up on the screen and also linked it for students in the e-learning space, our recent conversation article, which spoke about the contact tracing app within the Australian context. Um, so for students, as you're probably aware, Australia has implemented COVID Safe, which is a contact tracing application based on Bluetooth technology. Incidentally, and in terms of this discussion, it's based on a, an e-business solution, specifically a mobile commerce based solution um, conforming to our definition in part A of this lecture. Katina, what are your thoughts about the COVID-19 contact tracing app in general, um, what it means in terms of mobile commerce and any other thoughts you're happy to share with us? Well, it's a, a big area and uh, I'm learning equally as you are, Roba, about this space. Um, I don't know who mentors who sometimes, but I think uh, we have a very good solid background to face these challenges and issues. Uh, coronavirus contact tracing apps, what are they? Uh, well, we're trying to mimic an offline uh, contact tracing process um, that's been age old. You know, someone uh, gets sick, there's an epidemic, then health professionals go in, they try to find out where these pockets of uh, epidemics and outbreaks are, and then they respond. And usually it's, it's literally someone gets, phones you and says, you know, you've been confirmed case of measles or you have had a confirmed case of mumps. Uh, or polio or what have you and then there starts to be some further investigation well back in 2017 during the Ebola outbreak we had uh, the World Health Organization define contact tracing and it was uh, pretty much three steps uh, it was the identification the listing and the follow-up and if you were to do this in the manual world let's look at, look look at it from the manual perspective if you're a confirmed case you know you go to the doctor the GP tells you Oh, you've got temperature. Oh, you know, you've been coughing really badly. And this doesn't seem to be influenza. Uh, we've tested you for that. And this doesn't, you know, it's not something else. And we think it's COVID. We have to give you a test. And that test shows you that you're positive. You're COVID positive. Mind you, the current tests are not specific to COVID. It's a generic kind of test that alludes and suggests you have COVID-19. So then what would happen is they would ring your, uh, uh, tell you, you know, who have you been in contact with in the last two weeks? You would say, you know, my wife, my kids, my work colleagues. I've also visited a, uh, a cinema. Perhaps I've also gone to a football match and um, that's it, you know. So they would start to basically investigate. Um, and unfortunately, with what we know with the novel coronavirus, um, which we perceive or believe began in Wuhan in China, 
what we know of that is it's really highly contagious. So if you've gone to a footy match and you're with a group of friends and you're together and you're, you know, shaking hands and you're embracing, most likely um, the group of you would have COVID if one of you have COVID. Um, and then you'd go back home after being exposed to it and you would actually um, infect your kids uh, or your spouse. And purely through saliva, through surfaces, through any of this kind of thing. So the online version, this COVID safe app, is supposed to actually trace who you've come into contact with. And it's not location-based in some countries, although in others it is. But in Australia's context, COVID safe is merely mimicking the manual health surveillance process of contact tracing. And what we're attempting to do is to use technology to automate that process. And for example, uh, some people have suggested you could use credit cards to know where someone has been because you're always making contact with the reader or some other people have said um, maybe your Opal card could help in the identification of the spread of the virus once there is a confirmed case. Yeah. But in the instance of COVID safe, we're using a Singaporean based bluetrace.o.io tool. And what we're doing, we've adapted it. Uh, the Australian government um, has adapted it through the help of some private organizations and also the De Department of um, Transformation Agency, uh, the Digital Transformation Agency, but they've offered a solution of which approximately one in four adults in Australia have adopted if we look at pure download rates. It doesn't really equate to installation rates, but what we do know is there are some challenges with what I would call a public interest technology, right? This is a technology that has been deployed by government for the public interest to support the return to work, the economic prosperity of the nation, and to try and eradicate the pockets of bursts that we have of coronavirus. For example, we've seen these isolated cases in Tasmania. We've seen them in other places. Well, how do we ensure there's not a second wave as we slowly phased away return to work? How do we ensure there's not a second phase of the virus outbreak that is even worse than the first? And the government's approach was, hey, why don't we create an app to actually see how this plays out and get to people with and have earlier intervention in the process so that that and infect more people and somehow reduce the rate of transmission. That was the hope. Sure. Um, so, Katina, thank you for that response. I, I think I'm going to pick up on a few points um, just yes, please. before we go on. Um, the first thing that interestingly ties back to what we've spoken about is um, thank you for mentioning the transition or the automation of a manual contact tracing process. So today in this subject, we've sort of tried to discuss degrees of digitization where electronic business is concerned, right through from your traditional brick and mortar organizations that have the physical presence to your click and mortar where we start seeing e-business and e-commerce functionalities um, serving as a supplementary channel as part of a multi-channel approach to um, e-business and to commerce in general and then we have our pure play where things sort of go online now in terms of the contact tracing app we've got this automation or I'd say semi-automation of um, an existing manual process what would you recommend um, if you were to recommend a, a way forward in terms of the contact tracing app? And you and I have discussed this many times and we've written about it recently as well. What would you recommend as an approach to the design of these apps? And we can sort of um, have a, a discussion about this now. So what we're trying to instill in students and what we've tried to do in this subject more specifically is to really focus on the idea of stakeholders and a user-centered approach to design and to think about who are the people that are affected by the design of a specific e-business application. So students have had the chance to sort of comment about it in terms of in the operations management landscape or situating a particular e-business solution back in an operations um, systems perspective or view of the world where you're seeing a transformation process at play and technology really in that instance serves as a supporting role. Um, and they've also had a chance and they're currently underway with a group assessment in which they are redesigning a system based on um, a lot of redesign principles and approaches and methodologies that are quite key um, in industry at the moment and also in research at the moment. If you were to think about a way forward in terms of either designing or redesigning the app and the system within which it exists, what do you think would be a way forward with this contact tracing app and how can we relate it to um, a general methodology of systems design and e-business slash mobile business um, systems design? Very so interesting answer, sorry, questions. Question. Yeah, oh, look, very interesting questions. And uh, I think the guts of your research, when I look at it, Roba, is to 
bring out the co-design processes, the stakeholder consultations, uh, stemming from your PhD work many years ago. Um, but also I think that's just your approach to uh, confirming good design process, right? When you look at um, systems design, how do you do that well? A lot of political scientists in my school are actually very heavily involved with scenario planning, for example. They're very heavily involved with town halls. They're very heavily involved with really asking mainstream society and not being exclusionary. Um, you know, we've got a, an office in uh, Washington, D.C., and our Consortium for Science and Policy Outcomes, they will invite homeless people. They won't run a session of 100 people without representation of the homeless mm -hmm. or those living with disability or those living with cognitive impairment or those in upper class or lower class economic um, uh, demographics and uh, those who are single parents, those in families, you know, the head of the family, the one that is unemployed. Mm -hmm. This is society. Society is not a fragment of people that hold full-time jobs in snazzy places that we call, you know, professional business environments. I mean, there's certainly a, a, a group of the total society, but what about the people engaged in agriculture? What about the people who are hairdressers and uh, tradesmen? What about the people um, who have received redundancies and can't get another job, you know, in their late 50s? And, and when you want to deploy an app, you can't deploy for 90%. You know, we, we talk about the common good and utilitarian ethics and the whole sort of uh, rhetoric around the COVID-19 apps all over the world has been for the common good. And when I've asked the question, well, who did you consult? And Robert, you've asked the same questions. The response is, but there was no time. We knew this was a matter of um, minutes and days and we had to deploy and we weren't going to wait. Mm. If you're not going to wait, what has happened in the case of the Singapore Trace Together app, what has happened in the case of COVID Safe is actually what you expect, a another failed IT implementation. Apart from the fact that the COVID Safe, unfortunately, is riddled with errors and bugs and issues, for example, those with Apple iPhones traditionally, I think the bug has now been addressed, but in the first two weeks, uh, there were issues with it being active and running in the foreground and sometimes not with other applications. In other devices, there were issues with battery power and how long you could run COVID safe before it killed your battery. In other cases, um, people are saying that it doesn't work with obstruction because Bluetooth, which is a non-line of sight technology, is obstructed by metal, water in the body, uh, marble or concrete. Well, that exists in all the environments. And what we've seen is, unfortunately, Okay, let's for a moment say that the government had the, the right to say we had no time, we were worried that this crisis, this pandemic would be out of control. Well, they didn't even, I believe, from my minor testing uh, and ability to download the app myself, they didn't actually do much operational testing. There were no morphological um, environments. For example, contexts were missing. No one went onto the train station on a, on a train with a hundred other people at once and saw how these devices worked, whether the Bluetooth would be able to record an accurate proximity of one and a half to two meters between devices. No one went into a building situation where there's Bluetooth everywhere, in the ears, on the, on the hand with wearables, on the printer, outside with a car. No one saw the conflict of noise. And the other thing is nobody tested this with people who already have uh, diagnostic or implantable devices such as cochlea, uh, heart pacemakers or, or diabetic pumps that require programmer devices. So it was like we haven't done our homework. Having said that, and, and some nation states will claim this was fantastic, this worked great, this is working. Okay, but uh, well, then we're looking at mandatory deployment in places like India, for example, China, Taiwan, South Korea, where they're even wearing electronic bracelets. Um, but what has happened now, and Robert, we've reported on this with Consumer Electronics Magazine a few days ago, is that Google and Apple have run to the rescue of government. So we're seeing this, here's the industry, here's the government, oh, we need you, we need you. And so uh, Google and Apple are now joining forces to try and say to the government, don't worry, we know our operating system better than you do, we'll fix it in phase one of our two-phase deployment. 
Thank you, Katina. Some really important points there. I think it's really interesting that you mentioned the testing as well. So in um, our previous lectures, we spoke about traditional ways of de designing and developing systems. And if you think about it from, you know, a basic principles kind of perspective or the, the phases that should be present in the design and development of any system, you have your requirements analysis, you have your feasibility studies, you have all of these areas around analysis, design, implementation, and then testing, which seem to have been at, at first glance overlooked because of, in one way, because of the nature of the pandemic and the need to quickly get something out there. But I find it's really interesting, even from a waterfall model perspective or from the traditional way of designing systems, um, that there was no concept or no clarity around those specific areas. And that's what we're trying to do with the class um, at the moment and with our class at the moment is to have an appreciation, particularly for those um, initial planning phases of any systems design or development effort, framing everything as a system that's tightly interlinked, that has, in this case, a shared objective of maintaining, for instance, the health and safety of um, citizens, for example, and how best to achieve that particular objective within, a, firstly, a range of constraints, and secondly, within the idea of being able to plan appropriately, to engage appropriately, to do our homework in terms of those really important initial phases of, um, of systems design, whether they're mobile commerce based systems or otherwise. So I think it's really um, uh, interesting that you mentioned that point and I think that point might resonate with students because now they're having a go at um, a redesign effort themselves and looking at how best to engage in all those preliminary stages. Um, and you also preempted some discussions around um, the Google contact tracing app and things around prize privacy preservation and how best to do that. Now we will have a lecture as part of this subject um, in a couple of weeks focusing uh, specifically on the social, ethical and regulatory considerations around all of these applications. Um, can you for that lecture just um, describe a bit about your public interest technology and the frameworks you've got in place at ASU at the moment? Because I, you did mention um, this as being a public interest technology and I'd really like to pick up on this public interest um, element in further uh, in future lectures. Well, it's a, it's been an amazing learning curve for all of us. Um, when we talk about public interest technologies, let's break it down. So it's about technology in the public interest. If you if I was to summarise it, in other words, it's tech for good. Uh, it's not tech to rip you off. It's not tech to create more demand so that I have more revenue. It's tech for good. It's putting technologies in the hands of not for profits. It's putting technologies in the hands of non-government organizations, being an enabler for citizen science. Um, it's less about big corporations, although big corporations are also jumping on the bandwagon of public interest technology. I think the time of, if I may say, uh, you know, profit maximization at the guts of business is, is coming to a limit. You know, I think uh, most people have worked out big organizations who and I don't mean to pick on big organizations because most of you will be employed by these organizations. But as I tell my students, if we go in with a different ideology, bit by bit, things change. Um, and so some of the big names behind this notion of public interest technology is the New, New America Foundation, is Mozilla Foundation, it's the Ford Foundation, it's um, uh, the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, a lot of these foundations that realize the the, the days of us believing that business is about profit maximization is coming to an end. We don't get into business to make more money. We're going to business to actually meet the needs of society. And I think this has been a, a revolutionary shift. May, mind you, there have been many organizations and institutes over the last 60 years that have always said the same thing. I know the uh, Robert, the society we're part of, the IEEE Society on the Social Implications of Technology have always had tech for good at the basic premise. IEEE's motto is advancing humanity through technology, right? It's, it's about humans advancement. Um, and so what I think we're doing with public interest technology and a, a little plug, uh, Robo, I've just um, had a degree approved, a master's of science for any of the students who are thinking about, you know, is, is it worth studying? I've got a master's of science being launched in September in public interest technology. Um, and it's congratulations, thanks. Katina. Thank you. It's been two years. So I'm smiling <laughs> profusely. It's an online degree, so you don't have to leave Australia. Um, but I'm looking for people who are interested in this topic from very many different angles. And we talked about mentoring. I think, Robo, we have the same spirit in the pedagogical way. We, we talk about things to our students who we see as equals. 
Okay. It's about us imbuing a spirit of um, being having technology design at the heart of user-centered design, right? It's, it's why do we do this? We do this because there are human needs. There's a use value. There's a point to it. And what we need to do is get better at it. So I'm not having a go at the government, for, for, for example, for releasing a dodgy product because that's what it was. In the end, they tried to do something in the public interest. It was done in a way that, that could have been better. Okay, we've learned from this experience. How do we do things better the next time? There is a major issue, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's another kind of crisis like bushfires. Absolutely. Whatever we do, we actually know that at the heart of it are actually technologies like this, right? They're, they're, they're our phones. Mm -hmm. And although they're considered to be ubiquitous, right, and they give us um, like this ability to be anywhere, right? They give us ubiquity. Mm -hmm. The issue is not everyone has the same kind of phone. It's a heterogeneous environment. Yes. And so out of all of this, I think the public interest is showing us heterogeneous is important. We've got to believe that. We've got to understand that. Choice that people can make in a democratic nation is important. We can't remove the choice of people to opt in or opt out. But there are some ways to do that. I don't think the government SMSing everyone saying download this app was actually a good idea. I think it backfired. They got maybe 100,000 odd downloads, allegedly, but I think it backfired because it looked more like the government was trying to go, oh, compliance, we got 40% of Australians uh, to download and now everything is fine. It wasn't a waste of money. Whereas the ideology and the thinking and the spreading of the communication should have been about helping, being together, helping each other. Um, but of course, we, we have an app that sort of doesn't work and it may work better in a month when Google and Apple are, you know, have finished with it. But right now, um, the jury's out with its effectiveness. I would rather have seen us put more money into foot soldiers, inverted commas, foot health professionals, social workers, and go, on, go, on, go out there, they're contact tracers, that's what they're called in the States. Go out there and help people, you know, not be scared and not have fear and have better education about COVID. Make sure they're in hygienic practice. Make sure if they're feeling sick, they don't go outside and they isolate within their homes. Uh, make sure people wash their hands, you know, make sure people keep their distance at shopping centers. This is more important right now than a nap. Yeah, thank you, Katina. So there are some points that I'd love to build on at the moment, but I think in the interest of time, and I know I've got a, a lot of areas we want to get your feedback and your input on, I'll pick up this discussion and things around public interest in the week um, 12 lecture, so in two weeks' time, and I really look forward to it. There's a lot to discuss in this area, Katina, but I think what's really important for students to see is that everything they are learning in class does have, have this real-world value. The choices they make, the um, philosophy um, of design and their philosophy in terms of how they approach in, in this instance and for the purpose of this subject, electronic business, but also beyond that for those who are more um, technically um, uh, oriented. So we do have some students who design um, these systems and who are doing an e-business um, major, for example, and more um, technical majors, that they do have some input into the actual design and that do have some agency as to how they approach their philosophy of design. Now, having said that, other students who are coming um, at this and approaching this from a different perspective, the marketers, the managers, I guess what I take away from um, what you've just mentioned and also our work over the you know, um, close to 15 years is that involving people from these diverse backgrounds is a healthy way of doing it in the public interest. Um, but I'd be very keen to pick up on other discussions, hopefully in our Q&A, Katina, we can, uh, we can look um, into yeah. this in a bit more we'll detail. Next topic, just a small topic that is the Internet of Things. So just to frame this um, for you, Katina, um, we had a minor um, overview uh, in the interest of time, again, um, about ubiquitous computing, just extending on from our discussion of m-commerce and also location-based services um, to discuss ubiquitous computing in general and what that affords us and also alluding to some of the um, socio-ethical implications of ubiquitous computing. Now, there's a lot of um, information out there about the Internet of Things and how it relates to to our study of e-business and so on. But I just thought um, we'd think about this in terms of um, a simple 
um, understanding of what it is. And for the purpose of students, it is um, about a future world where there is increased levels of connectivity between things. Now, Katina, you've done some work in this space. Can you describe to us perhaps um, just a, a brief overview of some of that work that touches on elements of the Internet of Things, specifically in terms of the need to look at socioethics as related to the IoT? So let's break it down really simply. I like the quote in red that you've got. Anything that can be connected will be connected. And basically we're talking about assets and assets in any context, whether it's your home, your workplace, at a public location, uh, like a library, everything, if I can say, is alive. Everything has an IP number. Everything can be remotely triggered. Everything can sense the environment around it. And on chipsets and motherboards, what we're trying to do now, uh, for example, Intel uh, and many other organizations, including Samsung, many of them in the smartphone business, would you believe, are trying to look at on a particular uh, chip, what can you include? Um, I was at a tiny machine learning conference last year where Samsung was present. And so machine learning outside and away from the cloud onto the device itself, um, for example, instead of having machine learning computation in the cloud, why don't you have it on a device? And the issue at that point is about how many sensors you can pack on to a small space before the thing stops working. And I can't reproduce um, en masse um, these chipsets. I can't do the fabrication. It's too small. It's too tiny. But you'd be amazed how much things are being packed on. So in the beginning, we had mostly just a, uh, an IP number on certain devices. Now we've got a location sensor, a temperature sensor, you know, a directional sensor, a GPS device sensor. We've got all these sensors. Our phones have about 14 uh, sensors at the moment. But in the future, when we're looking at specific devices, uh, you might be able to trigger your lamppost from afar. Um, you might be able to turn on your washing machine, and many people do from afar. And so hub devices control those assets within your home and you are able to somehow connect via whatever modem you want, whatever mode modality you want, whether it's by phone, by internet browser, whatever. Now with this come a lot of um, additional expenses, which at the moment we can see Moore's law kicking in um, things becoming smaller and faster and reducing in size every two years or so. Um, and so affordability is there and we, we have, done a lot of studies in the past where we've looked at uh, radio frequency identification sensors as opposed to barcodes and how much that would cost. If everything had an RFID tag on that, how much would it cost? And Robert, one of our colleagues now, um, Nicholas Huber, spent a long time studying this um, in, the, in terms of loss prevention in the supply chain. And he did some wonderful work. We, we looked at, you know, how much would it cost? If it cost 10 cents, if it cost 4 cents, if it cost 2 cents, um, what would, what would it look like? But if we're looking at more sophisticated kinds of IoT devices, they generally have more sensors on board and they're not just RFID contactless labels uh, that can be scanned on, on, on moving through or the more correct term is being read as they're going through a conveyor belt, um, um, getting onto a plane with a fixed reader, um, getting onto a truck through a mobile reader or having a driver um, interact. But think about everything around you being alive Think about you being able to scroll down on your mobile phone on an app and go switch off, switch on, you know, um, do this at this time of the day and personalize the environment around you. Um, but Internet of Things is exciting and also um, awesome is the word I would use. At the same time, it's how are we going to ensure that these devices are secure um, and the data is being used for what, the, what, it's been, what is being collected for in the first place? So that's a bit of an overview, Rosa. That's an excellent overview. Thank you, Katina. Um, the next sort of question, maybe could you like rapid fire questions with this? Go ahead. Is around how do you feel the Internet of Things will affect the operations management space, yeah. so supply chain management, and specifically e business? So, what do you see at the top, top Explosion. area? Explosion. Customers want to know where their goods are, at what time, you know, if they've left the warehouse. When, they're out, when the good is outside their house, and we've had some interesting experiences with Amazon where they say your good has been delivered and actually it has not, yes. um, just to reach this. So it's all logistics, it's all supply chain. 
look what's happened in America with COVID, with PPE, with personal protective equipment, mm -hmm. no masks or limited masks. There's been an issue with goggles. There's been an issue with gloves. There's been an issue with everything you can imagine. And really it comes down to what's the most effective way that we can sense our system. And there's four Vs, of course, of velocity, variability, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we're talking about silent commerce. We're talking about knowing where things are at any point in time during um, a process of movement and its availability, right? How can I produce more of something and it get to the places where it needs to, um, but very agile supply chains, but it's all about fulfillment um, and also ensuring where your supply chain is. Are we, are we relying on international supply chains when really we need them to be in state because things are frozen just like they have right now. A lot of supply chains have been caught out Robo, because they were never expecting goods not to be moving between one country and another. Yeah. Right. So um, I think internet of things is, is everyone wants to know where everything is now, right? Not, not tomorrow, not yesterday. And we're becoming increasingly impatient as consumers as well. We want things delivered all the time. We don't want to go to the shop physically to get things. Yeah, and so IOT will have everything tagged, even your front box, right? Where you receive your letters and your mail and if the RFID on what's being sent, the tag does not match your post box, you're not gonna you're not gonna accept that piece of mail, right? That's where we're getting it, or that delivery. You know, we may get into a future where we trust and we may have particular kinds of little storerooms just outside our home, connected to our home where deliveries happen. But you can't chuck or shove the delivery in the item unless that code goes match. There's a match here. I'm allowed to put it in. I'm not going to, it's not going to be a bomb or it's not going to be a, you know, some device that I don't want or I didn't order. So we're getting to that point, but yeah. it's location based. Definitely. Yeah. Five so points. Katina, what's really interesting is your mention of what consumers expect so consumer expectations. And we spent an entire lecture talking about understanding consumers in that lecture. We spoke about analytics. We spoke about consumer behavior. We spoke about um, understanding consumer behavior. So the factors that influence them, both things that are, beyond our control, but also the things that we can control. Now, in light of the Internet of Things, and you mentioned security earlier um, in the discussion around um, what the Internet of Things is, what else do you think we need to account for that perhaps consumers are unaware of with the Internet of Things um, in terms of socioethical implications, for example? So security being one, what, what other things might, we, um, or might emerge as interesting areas of discussion as these um, systems start to um, uh, become prevalent? I think quality and condition of the good is an important thing. Uh, if I'm, if I've just bought, uh, you know, a hundred kilos of prawns and they're being delivered to me to sell at a fish market, I want to know that those prawns were in a good condition, mm -hmm. right? So traceability is an important thing. End to end traceability, knowing the condition and monitoring the condition of your good between hops in the, in the process of delivery, right? Right from the raw materials, right down, to the point of I'm delivering this finished good, it may well be prawns, which is the finished good. You know, it's a raw material has come from the ocean. It hasn't really possibly been that processed, but it's moving. I want to know that that truck, I want to trace that that truck has done the right thing. Um, and it hasn't broken down somewhere in 40 degree heat. And if it's Arizona, it's 50 Celsius. And I want to know that it's going to be fresh. So my customers can rely on a fresh product and I maintain my quality. Another thing of course is privacy. And with this Internet of Things phenomena, what you have now is microphones accidentally being placed in items. Oh, sorry, we forgot the microphones in such and such a product, you know, Nest. Or, with, you know, and I don't know which design team in the universe would forget, to act, forget the fact that they actually embedded sensors in the majority of products that went out the door that they designed. You know, I find that hard to believe, but it's possible, hey. You know, but it just demonstrates the the lack of awareness, right? So IOT, my worry in terms of privacy is what is being done? Um, you know, even the, what technology we're using right now, it's not IOT, but I imagine in the future that Zoom, imagine Zoom on a device mm -hmm. and it's somewhere outside on a lamppost and it's sensing the environment. And what we have then is Zoom embedded in a lamppost, which is, has motion detection, it's solar enabled, um, and it's listening to the conversations around the street. I mean, should it? It's a public space. Uh, is it intrusion? 
but this is what IoT is actually butting up against, is mm. how I, IoT-ified are we going to get? You know, is it going to be sensors here, there, and everywhere? And we are not really buying in. We don't even know the sensors are there. They're, um, um, or they're covert sensors. They're unobtrusive. I can't see them because it looks like a lamp fixture, you know, but it's listening. The lamp is listening to me or the wardrobe is listening to me or the car is listening to me. It's going to be very odd. So we're seeing a lot of this speech to text to image translation and visual analytics will be massive. And I think it's going to be all IoT slash machine learning and AI. Interesting that you brought that up. We'll, we'll cover that in a second as well. But you've given us so much food for thought, Kat. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot to discuss in the social, ethical and regulatory <laughs> implications lecture. <laughs> I think we're going to have to extend that one. Um, to artificial um, intelligence and machine learning as an extension of your discussion, Katina. So we preempted that. You probably um, are going to notice in terms of the way this uh, guest lecture is framed and the prompts for you is that a lot of it is sort of geared towards the operations perspective and the operations mm -hmm. space, just based on um, the background of the subject and what we're trying to achieve in terms of student learning outcomes. But all the points that you mentioned are tightly linked to what we've discussed in this subject. And, and the approach we've taken to this subject is to acknowledge that we are going to dedicate one lecture to the discussion of um, the social, ethical and regulatory implications of electronic business, but we are going to have placeholders in each of the lectures to flag when a specific technology or a specific concept that we're speaking about might engage with the, that, those kind of concepts. Um, now, in terms of artificial intelligence and machine learning, I've included two specific um, uh, two specific case studies, if you like, around Volvo's autonomous transportation vehicles and also some of the Tesla future of driving um, resources around, um, uh, around its autopilot features and the self-driving capabilities which we're starting to see um, emerge and become increasingly popular in the market. Now, in terms of logistics specifically, so let's look at that. Um, what comments do you have about artificial intelligence and machine learning as an extension to what you just mentioned um, and its impact on mobile commerce specifically in e-business in general? Well, that's a huge area and I'm yeah. going to try and make it concise um, and say a couple of things just broadly. Yes, please. Um, we can look at computational improvements, for example, processor speeds, and we can as opposed to the computation capabilities that we have, we can look at algorithmic improvements. And we can also look at them at the same time. Um, if we look at it computationally, how much faster can we get before that nanometer becomes impossible to go better? And then we start to talk about quantum computing, neuromorphic computing, and other kinds of uh, abilities to process things. You know, I want you to think about how good we can get on the logistics side by stacking CPUs one after the other or graphical processing units one after the other, the GPUs, because both are important. But you've got to design algorithms to actually take advantage of the way you're stacking the CPUs. Okay, there's a limit, it's finite. Now, when we talk about autonomy, we're talking about um, the ability for something uh, to occur without human intervention. And there are various levels of autonomy that we're seeing being deployed and defined. Uh, if you look at, for example, the SAE, they'll define X number of, um, you know, from manual to automation. And I've seen presentations of, of these guys, uh, for example, at uh, Phoenix Moby last year in September, um, an amazing thought provoking ideas whereby, you know, we're trying to do our best by simulating autonomy, for example, in vehicles, um, on programs and then we're stepping outside to closed campus situations and letting the autonomous transportation go and then we're actually on highways I mean you know there's a there's a story that's pretty old now I think it's probably 2012 there was somebody I was working with at the University of Southampton who was taking a, a, a inter sort of country in Europe trip between one nation state and the other and there was a closed screen and sort of the, the butler or the person who was driving, right? The, the chauffeur, I should say, um, seemed at one point to be swaying this way and that. And uh, uh, she knocks on the screen, he opens the screen, he turns around and she's thinking, oh my God, he hasn't got his hands on the, on the, the steering wheel, right? So she, he's turning around talking to the professor 
And she's like going, what? You know, I should have realized there was no one driving except the car. Now, autonomy in terms of large transportation has an amazing prospect. You know, I, I, I talk to some lawyers who tell me autonomous vehicles can't fail because trillions have gone into this industry. Um, and if they do, we're all in trouble because there goes trillions of dollars of money just in the US alone. At the same time, um, we're looking at the displacement of about 60,000 workers, if not more, um, just in, in America itself. So there's massive issues. I, I mean, where I work, the street where I work was the first Uber death um, with a training driver behind it. It's South Mill Avenue, literally right outside the university at ASU. Um, and of course, that sort of crunched down Uber's testing uh, in the area. But we've got Waymo. Waymo is doing pilot tests from a suburb called Chandler to where I work at Tempe. And I've taken videos of the autonomous cars Sometimes in the early days when I first arrived in Arizona, literally the day I moved into my apartment, the test driver was holding onto the steering, but it was autonomous and I could see and then and turn left or right. So there'd be this stop, start, stop, start, stop, start with the guy holding onto the, the vehicle. And of course, me taking the footage from across the road. This happened particularly in parking lots because this is a, a, a very complex territory. What I know for a fact, traffic lights are an issue, stop signs are an issue. These are the major things in windy roads. Tesla, Tesla's Elon Musk has said that, even himself, that windy roads are not good for us. Um, the other thing we have to perfect are traffic lights. But you'll see people in Phoenix, in traffic, not holding their Tesla cars. They're on autopilot. And you think, oh my God, you know, in a hybridization of manual cars and automatic cars and autonomous cars because you know you've got these issues but tesla has the response of sending feedback back to its operation center whereas some of the other companies like waymo doesn't do that it's not feeding back to to base it's collecting the data in a different way for example tesla has just gone straight to market they haven't said we're going to do this the right way we'll we'll test live whereas waymo has not tested live They've done all their testing previous to their pilots. And the pilots, the people in the pilots are people who have been screened. They're people who have signed non-disclosure agreements. They're people who are in need of mobility. But this, watch this space. You know, we've got Chinese, big Chinese companies now coming in. Uh, forgive me if the word is wrong, or I think it's Neo. Uh, that's, that's massive. Um, and there's, I would say, way ahead of the Americans, even with their autonomous vehicles and the way they're structuring their roads and infrastructure. Yeah, as you said, Katina, watch this space. I think it's really important that this area of artificial intelligence and machine learning is on the radar of students. So um, as part of this subject, there are many of these concepts such as the IoT and location-based services, ubiquitous computing, pervasive computing and so on. So I thought it'd be really helpful to look at it by way of um, representative examples and looking at, I don't think this is in the, um, it seems like it's an immediate or near future kind of scenario, Katina, rather than, you know, um, way ahead. Um, it's in now. Right? It's now in America, we've got trucks on exactly. the highway in America going interstate that are autonomous. There you go. And I think what you mentioned, Katina, in terms of that hybrid kind of scenario, I'd imagine, I haven't been in one of those situations myself, but I imagine it'd be quite jarring to see the before, it's almost the before and after. And I sort of liken it to the idea of, um, you know, the artificial beings that we're speaking about as being, you know, in our living spaces and our workspaces and robotics and um, other areas that we're looking at as part of our um, research projects. But I would imagine it would be quite jarring to see the before and after. It's definitely unbelievable. I mean, May of 2018, I saw the... Uh, I read about and actually reported in Australia about the Uber death, interestingly, because at that time I wasn't employed by ASU, but I was on their mailing list. I was on the school's mailing list. And I heard about the crash that killed the homeless person before my colleagues sitting next door to the building yeah. of the crash. I heard about it and reported about it about two days before. And all yeah. of a sudden it was news to the people there. Now, I don't celebrate that death. I also don't celebrate the problems that Uber was faced with. Of course, they would have been remorseful. But then the question is, when we look at the legalities, you know, they had to come out 
of a court case through this who's and say right? say it again Robo. i said who's responsible that was going to be my next question where's liability lie well who's responsible but also they were asked very much early on have you taken these scenarios um into um um consideration i mean they were having issues even with things sticking out like just say you had a lamp pole that someone had bent through an accident even though it was over the road they didn't the car didn't know how to handle it in this instance the woman was not on the zebra crossing she was she was a pedestrian a homeless pedestrian with a trolley she she it was it was late at night it was nighttime it was pitch black there was bad lighting but she didn't cross at the crossing right i mean she was she was literally jaywalking but not far from the crossing now the question is why wasn't that a scenario i mean oh duh. Mm -hmm. and i i i gave a, a talk at the uh, phoenix stop maybe where there were many driverless cars and autonomous vehicle vested interests in the room and i said look we're going to do a life scenario and i just gave them an a, just very basic fundamental examples i said okay i want a volunteer from the audience come up and i think it's on my website robo but i want you to um demonstrate uh you're in an autonomous vehicle it's going somewhere you know you've been picked up it's a ride share it's a taxi right in, in in essence you've been picked up and it's taking you somewhere the opposite direction to where you're going and then it just stops what do you do mm -hmm. and i asked the people on stage to actually walk through what they would do and windows are closed it's 50 degrees celsius in summer in arizona you've got minutes yeah. You've got minutes before you're dead, basically. Mm. Oh, I'd use my mobile phone. Okay, what if you didn't have your mobile phone? Okay, we need not just to think about the autonomy, but the process of human intervention. There's a human in the car. That's what's important here. Um, it could be a blind person who wants mobility desperately, and their lives may change completely with, with uh, autonomous vehicles. I, I heard a talk by Waymo's policy head. He used to work for Google. And there were people from the, the blind community on stage talking about how liberating it was to get in a car without somebody holding their hand and going, I've got freedom, I can go to the city, I can go here, I can go there. And I, I think to myself how liberating it would be or for somebody in a wheelchair or for somebody who's living alone. It would be incredibly liberating. The only issue there is the rest of the infrastructure in our society has not been created with environmental purpose for the disabled, for the blind and so forth. So I think it will liberate. I also think we were looking at one model, a robo I'll just quickly mention, we were finalists in the Schmidt Foundation grant. Uh, we made the top 12 with the team that I was part of, led by Thad Miller. Thank you, um, but we lost. <laughs> um, but it was about, <laughs> yeah. People in America are so poor in some places, they don't even have enough money to fix their car when it's broken down. Yeah. Okay, it's a second or third or fourth hand car. And if we could increase mobility, it means people can go to their interviews for jobs. It means people could visit the doctor and not be so sick. And what we were looking at in this project is if we offered, if you're in a particular lower socioeconomic group and we offered free mobility, how much would that increase someone's propensity to work, someone's health, their ability to take care of their kids and perhaps go to the kids' appointments, dentists and what have you? and simply to be free because we don't realize that i didn't have a car in arizona i still don't and for two years i've been walking everywhere or relying on ride share and i've quickly come to realize how if you don't have a car you can become very depressed unless you have the ability and the access to knowledge to get in another car or you know we're not going to all have cars in the future the other thing is we're going to have autonomous buses they'll be picking us up from the suburbs trucking us maybe to wollongong for example and going, okay, from there, you know, use your own modality to get to where you're going to get to. Either pull in a vehicle, uh, get on a scooter, get on a bicycle, right? This is the mentality of where we're moving towards. It's reducing pollution and carbon zero footprints. Sure. I think um, these are very important points, Katina. I really like how you address both the positive implications and also the less desirable implications because it's, I think, really important for not just for students in design subjects or in e-business subjects, but just the public in general to understand that we can't really um, 
uh, we can't really think of this in one particular manner. We need to be thinking about those scenarios, as you mentioned, and the scenario planning accordingly within a broader consultation or engagement um, framework so that we are accounting for the vulnerable groups, we're accounting for the positive uses, we're making um, you know, changes to the way um, people fundamentally live and their livelihoods, and that's not something that we should take lightly, but is very tightly linked to everything we're, we're doing in class, for example, about how do we design for, for, as you mentioned, I don't like using the common good, similarly to you, but how do we design for public interest? How do we account for those who perhaps um, are not empowered enough to account for themselves and represent themselves in these kind of um, design efforts? Um, I think I'll probably move on to some final thoughts before we think about future scenarios. Very quickly, um, thoughts regarding as we've framed or as um, most textbooks around e-business and e-commerce frame it as implementation issues relevant to e-business management. We've discussed some of these um, just by way of our discussion. What do you see as the technological barriers to e-commerce? It can be specific to any of those scenarios we've presented or it can be in general. What do you perceive to be the barriers, Katina? Um, I think certainly uh, some of the barriers at the moment is trust. Um, and I know this probably alludes to your third point there on the screen, Ray, but, but okay. trust is an issue. Um, there are still people using checks and still only using cash. Um, and that's people's right to do that. Um, I think additional technological specific barriers um, have to do with accuracy. Um, you know, I remember, Roba, uh, back when we were gathering data for, our, for your PhD and the, the, the project, the greater project that we were involved in with the Australian Research Council, uh, accuracy was something we really butted up against very quickly when we were using <laughs> GPS. You know, and GPS is supposed to, you know, 90% of the time have you within 10 meters of where your location is. But of, of course, there are these natural hazards, which I call uh, geography, uh, and, you know, Allegedly, Robert, you weren't where you're saying you were. And, um, oh, work, <laughs> <laughs> and I trusted the technology before I trusted you. But yeah. sure, you should put me a lesson there. So It makes for a good case study um, <laughs> almost 15 years on, Katina, 10 yeah. years on in this case. Well, it's still true. And that's the thing, you know, if I'm using location as an attribute in a system that is perhaps about identification and security, and I get it wrong, you know, then that's a, that's a massive problem. Fundamental, isn't it? And Katina, we're also thinking not just location specific, we haven't even touched on big data and big data quality and how that affects the accurate um, or the reliability of the data upon which some yes. of these systems can potentially be based on, right? And there are con conferences and, and the like that are focused just on data quality, for example. So it's location is crucial. And then you've got this, you know, this vast, these vast data sets that we need to be taking into account too. Oh yeah, exactly. Dirty data. You know, I used to work with that every day of my life in my networks company. Um, someone saying on a street address, it's the corner of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Smith Street and Princess Highway. What's that? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, um, and how do you get an accurate delivery? So the, the contrast between the longitude and latitude versus the geodetic versus the physical street address, mm -hmm. these are all issues that we're trying to overcome through geolocation. Um, uh, sensors, but big data, you know, what if I'm, I'm, it seems like I've been purchasing all these particular ideological books and then, or uh, I'm, in, I'm in a particular bucketed group and I'm out, you know, at a shopping mall and I'm being pushed services that have nothing to do with me. You know, gifts that I bought for somebody else are being misunderstood as gifts for me or my household. And so I think we're still in the early stages of the machine learning. Um, I think they will make increasingly mistakes. Uh, and we're also in the early stages of cleaning up big data and making it meaningful. But the other thing is availability and reliability. These are some of the, the um, specific variables that um, our colleague, Dr. Anas Aludat came up with his, in his thesis. And when he was looking at emergency services, it's, is the service available and is it reliable? And if it's not, then again, I go back to trust. You know, I won't, if I've had a bad experience with that e-commerce service, I won't use it again. Absolutely. Um, but what we really want is the agility in whatever context we want, whatever form factor we want to use e-commerce. And the truth is you can't. Some e-business sites and portals are not made for e-commerce, full stop. Exactly. They don't have 
that don't understand mobile traffic and they haven't looked at who is pinging them on what kind of platform. And it means that the web analytics on the back end has not been done properly. And Robo, I'm sure you've taught that. We have, yes. So we covered that, Katina. We spoke about um, web analytics. We spoke about um, other forms of analytics and how best to use that, but also how to protect people in the process of doing so. Again, back to those ethical um, issues and challenges. I think what's really interesting is when you spoke about usability. So if you haven't got these, you know, if you don't have a sense of how people are using a particular site, whether they're using a mobile portal, so we've introduced the notion of portals. Um, I think this is very important and significant to the student's second assignment where we're talking about opportunities from an operations perspective and um, as one component of that particular assessment I've asked students to um, analyze and assess a website um, using a predefined um, process um, to sort of guide that, um, uh, that analysis and also look at redesign opportunities and as part of that I think they're going to find particularly with the organizations and the e-businesses we're looking at as our case studies for that assessment that the m-commerce element isn't probably up to where you know where it should be in terms of um, whether it's built specifically for mobile commerce so if students can please take note of that for your assessments coming up soon um, again the, the usability and people not using the site is quite important because we spoke about um, trust Katina and we spoke about trust um, and uh, loyalty in e-business in general as being um, related to um, ideas around satisfaction and ideas around trust as well. So we brought up all of these concepts and it's interesting um, from an expert such as yourself to have those same ideas that we've been discussing time and time again throughout the course of this subject just brought up from a, a, a very practical perspective just in terms of customer loyalty and trying to uh, build customer loyalty which is the, in essence the purpose of e-business. So you're looking to turn leads or to, to um, uh, attract leads and turn those leads into customers and then just go beyond that process and we've mapped um, e-commerce processes and with that in mind. So thank you for bringing um, those up. Um, what can we learn, Katina, from failures in mobile computing and mobile commerce? What do you think? Um, not to repeat the same problems <laughs> and failures <laughs> again, um, but also, uh, yeah, I, I think if not built correctly and you're not talking to your constituency, you're gonna have a failure. Um, but where is the failure occurring? Is it in the application of the mobile computing? Is it occurring on the memory of the device itself? And less so these days, uh, but how is it being used? Um, you know, authentication is really important in mobile commerce. And if you're relying on a third party piece of software, like Duo, right? Mobile Duo that requires you to authenticate using a one-time password or in other cases to actually have your handset nearby. Um, that needs to happen and people need to respond to the two-factor authentication. But if they're not willing to respond, I don't know if it's so much a failure of the design. It's not. It's a failure that no one has been asked about how they would use this. Now, when I went to ASU, I had no choice. I had to download Duo. I had to use my phone and I had to be my phone had to be has to be with me still to this day you know I'm in Australia I'm roaming at the moment because I need that two-factor authentication for my email access for the services online but where it fails perhaps is when that security is not available or the users have not been consulted about what type of um, authentication they want to use um, but again we go back to accuracy it can fail in many different ways um, but a system that times out when you're trying to authenticate is terrible. And we've all been faced in that situation where you're just trying to log in and you can't. And here's the crux and the trade-off. The more security you have, which you need, for example, for banking applications on, on, the, on the go, um, the more you can have a loss of productivity or a loss of number of transactions. So you've got to make it, there's a fine balance. You've got to make it easy enough for the customer to use or the consumer to use and yet safe enough for that environment, whatever that application is. But it's when that fine balance hasn't been taken into consideration, you can have flops in all kinds of processes. The other thing is simple things like usability, going back to touch screens versus voice activated, voice versus um, pens versus whatever. You know, I think um, a lot of applications relying on voice or iris or retina are interesting, they're coming up. You know, you could be at a console somewhere at a point of sale and uh, you know, they might be asking you to stick your finger on there or stick your RFID contactless card and look what's been happening with contactless cards. You know, we've 
uh, it's been great for COVID. You know, people are suggesting I don't, I don't want to touch cash. I want, I want the, the, the plastic. But when it's very easy to steal someone's um, token, like their contactless credit card, and then go and make a purchase under $100 and do that 10 times in an hour, and then ditch the card, well, that's a failure. It's a failure of the whole system as a whole. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Katina. And I think that really talks to some of these um, ethical, legal, privacy and health challenges, which we've covered um, throughout the discussion. I want to give you some time, Katina, to talk about the future. So where just... you're at, Katina. So <laughs> your TEDx talk, which I've linked for students up on Moodle. Thank um, you. Tell us, what do you think the future holds for us? Uh, I can tell you what the future Very holds. Easy question. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I can tell you what other people think the future holds for us. Um, I, I think the future is, you know, as I say very often in my talks, is in our hands. Uh, we can, we are building the future. You are building the future. Um, and I don't want students to be stifled by their creativity, by the most amazing things they can conceive of. It's not impossible to actually get from idea to commercialization. Um, you just got to have bright ideas. And I think young people, I love them because they have bright ideas. You have better ideas than I do, I can guarantee you. Um, and so uh, I study futures from a perspective of um, an anticipatory framework. My boss, uh, Professor David Guston uh, at ASU, um, really has catapulted the idea of anticipatory governance into the mainstream literature. There's also Responsible Research Innovation, RRI, there's also ELSI, ethical, legal, and society, societal implications. There's also different ways of understanding how we do the process of invention, commercialization, diffusion, and so forth. But in this topic uh, with brain implants, I've been looking at a lot of deep brain stimulation devices in the biomedical domain. Uh, that's where I began to get interested in implantables, um, but also various implantables in the body, some of them that would authenticate using an RFID chip implant, but then if we go deeper and we look at sort of some of the neurological issues that we're seeing in society through different diseases, we can talk about uh, Parkinson's disease, we can talk about autism spectrum disorder, we can talk about uh, people with anxiety um, or living with depression and uh, depression that is not overcome simply by taking pills, it's, it's major depressive disorder. And so all of these things I'm talking about are sensitive topics um, uh, especially during COVID. So uh, I appreciate your affordance of me, of allowing me to talk about this. So ideas from various groups of people, some in the medical space and some in the engineering space, all of a sudden have, are coming up uh, in the engineering space. We've got the Tesla CEO, Elon Musk, talking about his invention, Neuralink. And Neuralink, I won't say is an invention, it's something he's vying towards. He's wishing to somehow create chips that are long lasting in the brain, which is not very good with heat. You know, it can erode um, electrodes in the brain, for example, if you're not making them in the right materials, with the right fabrication processes, with the right chipset design, how you interface with the billions of neurons in the brain. Elon Musk has this far out, you know, idea that we'll be creating brain to computer interfaces that can interface with the brain and extend our intelligence and the brain is highly computational. If we look at any chip in the world, the brain does it by many flops of, of, of um, you know, transactions in the head. So it's, it's like we can't reach, we can't even fathom the computational power in the brain, but how can re you reproduce it? Which is when people are going to neuromorphic computing, going, oh, how does the brain work? Let me simulate the neurons and the synapses in the brain working together, and let me simulate that and repeat that in the way I design my algorithm, literally. But what Elon Musk is saying, if we continue to improve our algorithms through brute force in machine learning, well, that's not really what he wants. He wants unsupervised learning. He wants us, he doesn't want David, uh, he doesn't want Kasparov beating Deep Blue, um, or sorry, Deep Blue, the IBM machine, beating Kasparov, the chess player, by brute force. And even though it's been, dubbed as AI, when the computer beat the human in chess and in Go, the best players in the world, DeepMind beat the, the, the famous Go player, the human, they were called brute force and self-play. That's, that's the language that's being used to describe it. 
it was still brute force. It was still many computations being used. It wasn't intelligence. And what Musk is um, arguing is that this chipset that interfaces with the wetware has to somehow overcome this brute force learning. He wants unsupervised learning. He wants sentience. He, and he wants the ability for the outside to interface with the brain. I want you to think about the most powerful network. I mean, I, I personally think that the internet will not exist in 20, 30 years time. It may well be the internet of brains. The brain being the most computational capable um, instrument, but to be linked via um, electronics. The first job, real job, long-term job I had in my engineering time, I w you know, we had Nortel come out with a handset that was that big. And I thought, look how small. And all of a sudden there were communiques internally going, now we're not, we've stopped the manufacture of the mobile phones because we believe it's going to be brain to brain interfaces, BBI, not brain to computer interfaces, brain to brain. And then I thought, are they talking about telepathy or well, it's not really telepathy, it's communications through some wireless capability ingrained in the chip. And we've got a lot of science fiction that is playing on this and also leading the charge. You know, who's driving who? Is it the science fiction films that are driving the invention or is it the inventors who are driving the science fiction films like Black Mirror and the ingrained uh, episode? But that's just a nutshell to say to you, when you're thinking about AI, are we thinking about prosthetics in the brain to help those with schizophrenia, MDD, uh, autism, as if correction is required and what balance would that be capable of? How will we say, oh, that's good. That person is happy enough. They're well enough now. Um, and uh, you know, even if we cure Parkinson's, you still got the aging process. Um, are we just letting people live longer with more ailments? But the AI, according to some of the inspired people in the transhumanist space, means that we can live forever ultimately by downloading consciousness onto some kind of chipset, which I think is bogus personally, but I do see the potential for what they're calling extended intelligence. I just would say personally, I'd rather keep my intelligence the way it is, even if it's dumber. But, you know, people like Elon Musk think we'll be left behind if we don't merge with the AI. That's the famous sentence that I think I'll just leave it at that for that. Thanks, Katina. So what do, you, what do you want students to start thinking about? So this is a very thought-provoking area. It's a very new area for, for most students, I would, um, I would assume. What would you like them to start thinking about in this space? Um, how they can link it back to their knowledge of e-business? How can they take this information and operationalize it in a particular way within the way they think and the way that they um, uh, assume their studies? Fantastic question. I mean, because this is quite far-fetched in many people's realm, right? Um, I want people to look at standards and patterns, and I want people to look at the body area network standards. For example, the one by IEEE. It's an 802 dot something dot something. And I want people to look at the creation of hubs on the human body. Now, let's just think in the future, we might be wearing several wearables, and we may have several implantables as we develop in our biomedical devices. For example, it could be future nanobots actually unleashed into the body. Um, and we've got professors on campus who have talked about this in the Polymer Institute, for example, IPRI on the innovation campus. Um, Professor Gordon Wallace uh, is a wonderful advocate of future technologies and how they may change the way we treat ailments uh, in the human body. And not just in, um, uh, in the space of um, medical and health, but beyond that. Um, so, Currently, we have a form factor that looks like this. And what I want students to understand is it's going to get much smaller. Uh, in fact, Samsung are launching their quantum whatever mobile phone soon. Uh, there was some press in that. I want you to think about your phone being this size. It's just a communications hub. And you're wearing it somewhere on the body or you're bearing it somewhere in the body. Now, implanting devices in the body actually causes issues to do with propagation and scatter, backscatter. And unfortunately, the, the water in the body doesn't allow signals to be read remotely, especially with long distances. For example, GPS doesn't work underwater. You can't embed GPS beneath your skin. Otherwise, we'd probably be all be embedding GPS beneath our skin to tell us where to go when we're lost and trying to orient ourselves. Now, remember, this is not the console. This is the device that is the node in the network, perhaps leading you to where you're going. And it could be a wearable device. It could be 
uh, and implantable, as I said. And then you're looking at, going back to the IoT, I want people to think about how we are going to be communicating with devices around us. Let's look at the lamppost again. Okay, imagine this was a smartwatch. It's external to the body and it's, it's, it's wearable and it's communicating to the lamppost. Okay, I've just walked past and the lamppost goes, that's Katina. Another operational scenario could be the implantable with the wearable. So I've got an implantable sitting here and it's communicating with this. This may have the GPS, but this has the identifier. Okay, then I might have another scenario, which is this with this. It's the wearable with the um, external, but it's a mobile device. This has the GPS and the computational grunt, and this has my physical and uh, vital signs and other characteristics. Okay. These are the operational scenarios. If you're thinking just mobile web, what is the mobile web gonna be? It's actually you. You're gonna be the end node, the lowest common denominator in that network. And often I used to tell off my students, because I came from a networks background, when they used to draw a network design and they would leave the customer, the, the, the end user and the consumer, they would show as just the phone. And I would say, that's not enough. There's a human, who is the end node, but now we're gonna have the decorporalization of the human body. I may have an implant. In fact, 10% of Americans, according to the NIH, have an implant. It could be a knee implant, it could be a, a diabetic pump. And in fact, as we live longer, more of us will have biomedical implants. Now, what happens if the biohackers are right and Elon Musk is right? Well, we may be all having a chip just behind the, the ear, or we might be carrying a device that's like an Apple Watch that does a lot more than just um, you know count how many steps we do. So I want you to think it's important to think of different mobile operational scenarios and think about this in body, on body, external to the body scenarios. Thanks so much, Katina. You've given us so much to think about. So thank you for that. I'm sure we're going to be having lots of discussions in class around that. Um, what I think is fantastic is your mention of the end user as the final note. And I know you've written about this, um, uh, written about this before. Um, we just spoke about earlier in this specific lecture about the importance of the end users being part of the value chain um, and to account for a range of stakeholders and so on. So I think it's um it's really important for students to um, note that link. But we just wanted to thank you for your time, Katina. Thank you, Professor Katina Michael from Arizona State University. It's a pleasure to have you in our class. And I think that students are going to benefit so much from your expertise and also from your thought-provoking questions and, and food for thought that you've provided us with. Um, any final um, comments or thoughts, Katina? Well, uh, I always enjoy speaking to you, uh, Roba, and I find uh, your questions always uh, uh, very insightful. Um, but also your preparedness for everything. This lecture, uh, the slides, uh, I know the students understand the quality of your work is really superior. I'm just feeling fortunate to be on this call with you and to be in your classroom uh, as a, as a uh, virtual attendee, but also I feel honoured. Uh, and hello to all the students at Wollongong, uh, wishing you well with the rest of your course and we'll catch up again towards the end of the semester, I'm sure. Thank you so much, Katina. The pleasure is all mine from my perspective and we're very thankful to have you in our class. Professor Katina Michael from Arizona State University.